has come to everyone since we moved on campus. She loves our program, our event. She's a great supporter. And every year she finds stuff new to tell us. And she's sort of become our expert on children's literature and issues of censorship in children's literature. And so without further ado, please let me announce the magnificent, the marvelous Dr. Sharon Barnes, Chair of Women and Gender Studies. And she's talking about 20 years of censored children's books. Give every book a chance. Give every book a chance. I'm sharing a PowerPoint, um, which is not typical for me. Um, my students will attest to my lack of technology skills. How does it look for you? It's great. It looks great. Okay, excellent. Um, good thing that uh, PowerPoint will design things for you. Um, I am talking about, uh, yeah, it's been 20 years for me, um, and I was trying to figure out if that was the beginning because I, I must have been at um, Kent State when you were at Thackeray's. I didn't know about that. Thank you to the committee and um, Paulette especially and um, for the fabulous uh, agenda you put together for all these years. It's been so educational and so fun. Um, and it is really one of my favorite events as well. Um, I'm a less good cheerleader, but I, I'll do my best. Um, <laughs> Um, and of course, celebrating our, our love for reading and our right to read and share information freely is something that we, uh, maybe, maybe it's age, but I certainly take it uh, less for granted all the time. So happy to stand in solidarity with everybody else celebrating our magnificent right to freedom of speech. Um, it is a pleasure. Uh, I want to dedicate my time today uh, to two really dear friends. Uh, uh, of this event, especially uh, Glenn Sheldon and Rain Arroyo. Yeah. Um, Glenn was my colleague in University College and he's been a longtime supporter of this event. And I'm fairly certain he's the person who recruited me to, to be, become one of these merry pranksters. Uh, and I'm grateful to him for that. And his partner, Rain Arroyo, who died in, in 2010. Um, I mentioned in the Q&A on Dr. Hussein's session that it was Rain who sparked my, uh, that conversation about the right to, for people to say things we find offensive. <laughs> so, uh, and I'm definitely still puzzling, puzzling that one out. So thank you in, in um, dedicating this to Rain and, and Glenn. And my agenda is to uh, uh, say a couple of things about myself and then about banned books generally, that's a little thing that I've done since I started participating in. Um, then a few highlights and, and maybe lowlights about uh, what I've learned about censorship of children's books over the years. And I have to say, I, I have very few conclusions to offer, but I'll be, hopefully there might be some good questions. So uh, that, that is not a picture of me, uh, but a few of our fantastic troublemaking students. Uh, and as uh, Dr. Kilmer said, I'm the chair of Department of Women's and Gender Studies. Uh, and we are uh, a department really interested in um, oppression and censorship of minoritized people is certainly a part of uh, what we look at and uh, what we talk about in our classes. So um, this, uh, the department is, has been a longtime supporter of this event as well and are, are grateful to. So as chair of the department, I'm happy to extend our gratitude uh, for on behalf of all our faculty and students as well. Um, I've been on the faculty for 20 years here and um, I'm, I'm honored, as I said, to be a part of it. And um, I've done children's books almost every year since I, I started with The Color Purple and I, somewhere in the mid-range there, I did a memorably horrible uh, 
year on on pornography <laughs> and then I went and then I returned to children's books I think at Paulette's urging but it's just become a little opportunity to touch base with what's happening with children's books uh, year after year so I certainly feel like it's been an educational experience for me and very very happy and lucky to share it with you um, so before I start talking about the children's books, I want to uh, talk a little bit about what we mean when we say banned books. And I, I think this image kind of says a lot about what we think it means. Um, but I do think banned, banned books may be a little bit misleading in terms of the complexity of what actually happens. Um, and uh, so sort of some, some background about that or some concepts related to that. The, the banned books list that the American Library Association points uh, brings out every year is books that have been uh, formal, have formal written complaints uh, filed with a library or a school requesting that the materials be removed because they are offensive. So that, uh, when we talk about banned books, that's, that's what we're talking about. Um, the, the Banned Books Week started in 1982 um, when librarians noticed a sudden rise in such challenges and started uh, sharing that information with each other in the Office of Intellectual Freedom uh, created this week. Um, and it's something that we've been celebrating um, for 23 years, as, as, as Dr. Kilmer said. So challenges, as I noted, are a, an attempt to remove a request, a formal request to remove materials or restrict access. Sometimes it's not remove it completely, but just uh, uh, require parental permission or have it in a space that's not available to everyone um, based on a group or a person's objections. A banning is when that actually happens, when the, when the book is removed or restricted access uh, to other people. So it's not just that the person doesn't want it, but that they don't want others to have it. Uh, and I think that's the big distinction, that the challenge is, you know, you can always just not read the book, right? But that you think other people should not read the book as well. Um, censorship then, th that term to me is closer to the banning than to challenging because this is uh, an, a, an actual change in access so that people are um, removed uh, from the, sh books are removed from the shelves, removed from people's ability to see it. Sometimes it's more like uh, removal from a reading list as I mentioned, um, restriction by grade level, um, uh, requiring parental permission for a child to check out a book, for example, um, that is made that decision being made by a governing body or an authority. I think when we think of censorship, we typically think of the government prohibiting our speech. And so um, to the extent that a school is a government or a library is a government, uh, that would be the case. But uh, other types of censorship occur as well, like vandalizing pages, tearing pages out, uh, individual people just removing a book um, or hiding the resources. And then, yes, actually burning them do does happen as well, sometimes in symbolic gestures. Um, it does actually happening. Um, and in the contemporary moment, again, referencing Dr. Hussein's talk, I wonder if we might actually consider um, spreading false information, um, a, a form of censorship as well, sort of making information harder to uh, sort or sift. I suppose there's probably another name for that. Uh, um, so uh, next I want to talk a little bit more about banned books generally, uh, the sort of uh, journalist questions, how many um, there's probably uh, between 2000, uh, the 2000 and 2020, probably around 10,000 um, challenges and or bans. Um, in 2019, the ALA reports 377 challenges up from 347 last year. Um, 566 different materials, again, not just books. Um, on the question of what, not just books. So 62% uh, uh, of the challenges were toward books, 15% uh, of the challenges, and this is 2018, um, were for programs or events. Interestingly, um, the drag queen reading hours have been targeted quite a bit. 10% um, targeted databases, um, magazines, films, and games. 
6% uh, targeted artwork and displays in libraries or institutions, and 7% uh, targeted social media, uh, uh, access to social media and things like that. Um, Drag Queen Story Hours, as I mentioned, have been targeted uh, along with LGBTQ content generally. Um, I was surprised, I think, over the years of, of doing this research, how often it's removing books from reading lists. Uh, because in a reading list, a parent can say, no, you can't read this one book. Uh, so to me, it makes no sense to remove a book from a reading list, which denies other people the opportunity to read it, even if you don't want your kid to read it. Um, who uh, challenges, you can see my fabulous PowerPoint is not changing, so <laughs> sorry about the boring slide. Uh, it's, it's usually parents who top the list. Um, this past year, or 2018, the data, the year that I had data for it was 32% uh, were challenged by parents. Although I've seen it, I think even 10 points higher than that. I feel like I remember one year it was 42%. Um, next, almost always second is patrons of libraries. So people who come into a library uh, and find something offensive and challenge it. After that, and that was 33% this year. Uh, following those two large groups, school boards and administrations, 13%. Uh, Librarians themselves or teachers at 10%. Uh, political or religious groups at 6%. Elected officials, 3%. And students at 3%. Uh, so a variety. Um, and I would say in the years, the last few years that I've been studying um, children's books, uh, I've seen more involvement of um, support for challenges by outside political groups like uh, American Family Association, organizations like that who would fund someone, uh, particularly with um, if lawsuits are threatened. And I don't have information about that. I don't know if Dr. Kilmer does, but I would be interested to know if we're seeing more lawsuits around removal. Um, where? Uh, public libraries 59% of the time. Uh, 23% in school libraries, 14% in schools uh, generally. And again, I think that would be more like reading lists uh, for a grade or for a reading competition. Uh, only 3% in academic libraries, like more like university libraries, and 1% in special libraries, such as like prison libraries, things like that. Um, and I'll say more about that later. Why are books challenged? Um, as you can imagine, for all kinds of reasons, um, including things you might expect, like they, people feel they're too sexually explicit or uh, they are vulgar in some way, inappropriate to, to an age group you see a lot, um, profanity. Uh, more surprising reasons would be um, anti-police uh, sentiment or maybe, maybe not surprising to you, religious viewpoint. Um, in terms of my observations about children's books, uh, I would say a lot of it is linked directly to LGBTQ content, whether they uh, articulate the reason is that or not. Uh, this year, uh, in the 2019 data, uh, eight of the top 10 challenged books were challenged or removed for LGBTQ content. Um, the only one, one of the two that did not have LGBTQ content was The Handmaid's Tale. Which, I, which is a book that's been around a while, which is kind of fascinating to see it back there on the top of the list. Um, books are challenged on more than one ground, of course. And um, as the ALA says, um, from all quarters and all political persuasion. So it isn't just a, a one community that targets texts as being offensive. And I think that was a surprise uh, to me when I um, delved into this research. And um, especially when the same book is challenged from um, sort of what you would consider traditionally left or con traditionally right uh, perspectives. And I definitely have some examples of that. Um, any year's information, the data that I just shared, is, is definitely not definitive. Um, not all challenges lead to books being removed. Frequently, they are not removed. 
Um, and having a book removed from one library doesn't mean it's removed from everywhere. So if you think of that burning book, uh, you know, a book doesn't just dis disappear around the country because one school or one school district uh, has decided it isn't appropriate for their, their community. So that's a good news. Even if um, uh, forces of censorship win in one area, it, it doesn't win everywhere. And in my study, what has been really heartening is that when uh, a challenge happens, the response sometimes promotes even more sharing of the material uh, because there's publicity. And so you often have a lot more people being exposed to the, to, to the challenged book. And I think that's also good news. Um, the bad news, I would say, um, is that uh, the ALA estimates that for every challenge that's reported, four or five probably remain unreported. Uh, so a few years ago, they said that roughly 85% of challenges go un unmarked. So that means it could be almost 2,000 materials challenged and removed that we don't know about. And certainly that level of potential, uh, potential censorship, I think, should be alarming to all of us who value freedom of speech and freedom of information. Um, and I think if you think about these numbers, uh, this I think would also count as bad news. Uh, you can imagine how many times uh, someone just pulls a book and throws it in the garbage and nobody notices. Or a, a principal tells a librarian to pull a book. Uh, or a, a librarian looks at a book that's raised controversy and says, I'm not even going to order that book because I don't want to deal with the, the, the uproar that might happen. So there's all there's a, a lot of complexity in terms of how censorship actually works and certainly self-censorship is a part of that as well. Lucky for us, librarians are, are a rambunctious group overall and really fight to keep books on shelves. Um, as a women's studies professor, I'm really interested in systematic oppression. So censorship for me is a really foundational issue. Uh, and certainly the interest includes um, minoritized people. And that really led me to focusing on children's books and particularly uh, LGBT content in children's books. And it started with a book called Antango Makes Three. And um, the, the book, uh, well, actually it started with, that's right, it started with Harry Potter. Um, uh, I was a fan of the Harry Potter series and I think Dr. Kilmer told me that it was being challenged. So I had to look into what the story was there. And it uh, really, since it was released, the first book, which you can see on the left there, uh, it rose not just to the top of the list into the top 10, but to the top 50 challenged books ever. Uh, which uh, is a, a much bigger uh, deal in terms of the number of challenges. And I saw in the research for this year that it's back on the list, uh, uh, number nine this year. So Harry Potter, since it came out, has been in the top 10 challenge books. And um, you, as you might expect, it's challenged for promoting the occult. Uh, so, and if you've read the book, um, it's true they are witches and wizards, but in terms of like actual pagan or whatever version of a, a, a cult religion you think that represents, I think it's maybe not uh, accurate. Uh, this year, a uh, Catholic church in, um, a Catholic school, pardon me, in, in Nashville, Tennessee, uh, banned and removed the Harry Potter books from their libraries uh, for referring to magic and witchcraft, for containing actual curses and spells, and this is a quote, um, that risk conjuring evil spirits into the presence of the person reading the text and for characters that use nefarious means to attain their goals. Um, so Harry Potter sparked uh, my uh, curiosity. And then um, just because of a particular representation that I saw, I started looking at representations of indigenous uh, peoples. And I wanted to emphasize two um, uh, the first time I looked at it, I looked at the, the book on the top, The Indian in the Cupboard by uh, Lynn Reed Banks. And my argument about this book is that it, uh, it's, it's the stereotyping in the book, and that's, this image is really a perfect example of that, is a form of silencing and de facto censorship. That especially when um, indigenous writers struggle so hard to get material into to the press, a book written by a non-indigenous writer about a, a character who uh, is from some generic random not 
representing any actual indigenous uh, nation um, and through really stereotyped uh, sort of the, uh, one of the critics calls it tanto ease, uh, mixing um, dress and, and traditions uh, uh, is, is a really unfortunate way of censoring really necessary information about indigenous lives and cultures. Uh, so uh, that the author was also not indigenous herself makes it sort of doubly offensive in my, uh, in my argument there. Uh, and of course, the fact that the, the film grossed uh, $35 million uh, it, it, when it was released. It, um, it just sort of adds insult to injury as well. <coughs> um, the other uh, text uh, in terms of stere stereotypes and, and um, challenges is the, the, the title was cut off here, The Absolutely D True Diary of a Part-Time Indian. And that's by Sherman Alexie, indigenous writer, American writer, uh, was the second most challenged book in uh, 2018. It's been on the top 10 almost every year for the past 10 years. Um, and uh, it means a lot of people find this book troubling. Uh, it also won the um, National Book Award for Young People's Literature in 2007. So this is a really powerful book. Um, and it's interesting to me, especially because it's been challenged on, on the left and the right. This is one of those books that uh, has, has been uh, challenged uh, for many really, uh, really annoying numbers of references to ma masturbation, but also it's been challenged uh, and, and challenged this year uh, by a middle school student, one who wasn't even in the class uh, that was reading the book um, because of the references to masturbation. Um, uh, in other years, it's also been challenged for stereotypical representation of indigenous people from the left uh, because two of the characters are, um, uh, the, the main characters' parents are both alcoholics. Um, Sherman Alexie has responded to the criticism and the challenges by saying, I write books for teenagers because I vividly remember what it felt like to be a teen facing everyday and epic dangers. I don't write to protect them. It's far too late for that. I write to give them weapons in the form of words and ideas that will help them fight their monsters. I write in blood because I remember what it felt like to bleed. So that's Alexi's uh, response there. Um, and this is what I started to talk about earlier. And uh, this is about uh, LGBTQ content in children's books. And this is really, really the heart of most of the challenges that I've seen. Um, and Tango was the first, one of the first children's books that I looked at because I was so fascinated by this story, which is of two chin strap penguins uh, that is actually based on a true story. And you can see uh, in the image, it's an award winner as well. Uh, they, but it were two male, it was two male penguins at the Brooklyn Zoo, uh, no, Central Park Zoo. And they coupled for many years and would build a nest and roll a rock into their nest and sit on the rock and never, never produce a baby penguin. And so uh, one of the zookeepers um, one year another uh, penguin um, pair produced two eggs that the, the zookeeper knew they would not nurture both and, and raise both children, both uh, baby penguins. So he put the, one of the real eggs in the um, so-called gay penguins uh, a nest and they sat on it and produced a baby <laughs> penguin. Um, and so uh, it's sort of based on a true story. It's a picture book and I think that raised a lot of alarm and it was challenged because of its homosexual content. Um, and one of the objections as well, the one I sort of found fascinating was that uh, it doesn't tell the whole story uh, because after this um, uh, successful coupling and the gay family. Uh, it, and it was interestingly challenged for being anti-family, despite there's this great little queer family. Um, but the, one of the male penguins left the peng penguin family and mated with a female penguin. And so the objection was that they didn't tell the whole story, which should include that, the, that there is in fact an ex-gay penguin story that needs to be told. So uh, of course it's about promoting the homosexual lifestyle uh, uh, in humans through the gay penguins. Uh, the other two that I've talked about over the years, uh, I Am Jazz is uh, a, an autobiographical kids books by uh, Jazz Jennings, who is a, a transgender girl who um, 
wrote this book really uh, to, to help spread awareness, like that was her intention, to, to create space for people to talk about trans issues. And um, it's been challenged, offensive view, viewpoints, offensive language, um, it will promote um, confusion in children. And um, they, uh, a school district in um, Illinois, uh, uh, got support from the Liberty Council, interesting name for people who want to challenge books, um, uh, for putting it on their anti-bullying list, uh, that they didn't think it should be there. It, it promotes non-factual, radical, and controversial assumptions about gender. Um, the reading of the book was canceled as a consequence of that, uh, but again, always with good news and bad news. Um, students at a local LGBTQA alliance partnered with parents and the local public library to sponsor a public reading. Uh, the human rights campaign flew in, um, the illustrator, and um, gave free copies of the book out. Uh, so a, a, a really big uh, public awareness uh, campaign happened and over 600 people participated in, in that reading and 50 nationwide readings happened of the book as a consequence. Um, finally, and I guess I'm getting close to being out of time here, George, um, Alex Gino's 2015 book, middle school book, uh, about also about a transgender youth, uh, has been on the top 10 since it was released and uh, is top this year. It's also won many awards, Lambda Literary Award, Stonewall Award, Children's Choice Debut Award, Gold Medal for Juvenile Fiction. Um, uh, in 2017, uh, a school board in Wichita, Kansas decided against including it in its libraries, um, citing references that are inappropriate for children. Administrators prevented librarians from using funds to purchase the book. Uh, and again, the, the flip side, good story, Alex Gino, uh, went on Twitter and raised enough money to buy the books for every district, uh, every school system, every school in the district in over an hour, in under an hour. Um, last year, a group called One Million Moms, um, uh, which is an offshoot of a group that I consider a hate group, the American Family Association, called on its followers to contact Scholastic to try to demand that they discontinue printing the book. Um, two, two Oregon school districts decided not to participate in the state's battle of the books because it was an option. And the consequence is that none of their students got to participate in the battle of the books. Uh, so negative uh, experience there. Um, and so in terms of um, having great wisdom for you, sorry, going to totally let you down there. Uh, I, I think I've already made it clear that challenges happen from a variety of sources, left and right, in a variety of um, ways texts are challenged and to a variety of, of, of um, institutions and libraries. Um, and I have this picture of the rockets with pride because I, I took a picture of that flag flying over the pride flag flying over the student union that I talked about uh, with Dr. Hussein. But uh, so my question is, what do we do? Uh, how do we protect um, the speech of the I I ideas that we hate, especially if it's intolerance? How do we uh, uh, that's a, a that's this is not this is not parting wisdom. This is a question and a struggle for me. Uh, uh, how do I protect speech that I hate, uh, and what is my responsibility there? And I guess that's a question I'll leave for you, uh, just to leave a little bit of time for um, uh, questioning and just to say thank you. And um, uh, intellectual freedom is the right of all of us. And uh, in, a, in, a, in a democracy that appears to be struggling, we're really at a mo moment where we need to think deep and hard about what our values are and how we live them. So uh, happy to be here in this uh, great space for that. Happy to answer or uh, take, take comments, questions, or try to answer a question if you have one. Okay, thank you, Sharon. So who has a question for Sharon? Let's check the social media. I can stop my share too so we can see. Yes, that would be probably a good idea. Oops, not that. There we go. So who has a question for Sharon? Well, so far I'm not seeing any questions uh, of any kinds uh, at the present. 
Well, I think you certainly covered a lot of territory and it's very important. I have a question that I think might be good. So how, how do these books that we're talking about, particularly the last three, how do those books benefit the children who get to read them? That's a great question. I think, um, and I was thinking about this when Dr. Hussein presented as well. I think that, um, because he was talking about dialogue and, and real dialogue involving um, equals. Uh, so my initial answer is, you know, exposure helps us understand other people. So um, uh, if you if you don't know anyone who's transgender or LGBTQ, reading a book helps you understand their experience, their humanity, etc. And of course, it really helps people. Um, like I was saying about Rain and I reflecting on seeing the pride flag that we never thought in our lives we'd see such a thing. You know, the the lack of media uh, about LGBTQ people is still a problem, but not nearly the problem it was. You know, when I was growing up, when there were literally no. Uh, LGBTQ characters in any version of media that I was aware of, I should say. Um, so I think a big benefit is recognition, uh, validation, um, exposure, but I also feel like um, the, the, the opportunity to, to humanize others and engage with dialogue is a benefit to everybody. Um, what, I, what I wanted to say was when I know someone who's different from me, I really am able to hear and see and understand their experience a lot better. And sometimes the only way we're exposed to difference is through books if we don't live in a diverse community, for example, or something like that. Do you have thoughts about that, Paulette, in terms of the benefits that I, that I didn't mention? No, I think you've covered them just great. I think it's important for us to get to know each other, and often that is through books. It's important for children to see characters they can identify with, who are like themselves in some ways. So I think you did a nice job of answering that question. Do we have any other questions or comments? Anything in Facebook? No. Samoji, you have your hand up. Can't hear you. Thank you for reminding me to <laughs> unmute. Uh, Sharon, thank you so much as always uh, for a great presentation. Always have things that I have to think about and things like that. I know that you had posed a question to the end, at the end of your presentation, but I want to rephrase the question I had asked Dr. Hussein, and this time from the point of view of uh, discussions around LGBTQ, um, issues um, where some folks want to use some maybe the scriptures also um, or evolutionary theory or whatever uh, to maybe justify their prejudice against maybe that particular group how would you handle such situations so that again you are not um, ending up quarreling with a family member or maybe a best friend and things like that Well, I think it probably depends on the, um, well, it depends on a lot of things. It depends on the relationship um, and, and the argument the, the, that someone would raise. I mean, I think if they're saying it's anti-scripture, I think, um, you know, fundamentalist readings of scriptures. Can you hear me, Moji? You froze up there. Um, fundamentalist readings of scriptures can be used to oppress all kinds of people. And, you know, the scriptures promote stoning and, and all kinds of things that we would not agree with today. Uh, 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 you know, um, hanging people on a cross, hopefully, is not something we would want to see anytime soon in terms of the Christian uh, tradition. So I think it would depend, and I think lots of cultures have um, survived for thousands of years with, with LGBTQ people in them. So I think... Um, uh, the sort of evolutionary argument, I, I don't think the human race is going to die out 
uh, because LGBT people exist. And in fact, I think we kind of have the opposite problem uh, in terms of population. So, uh, you know, maybe LGBTQ identities are a consequence of evolution. <laughs> I don't know that I would make that argument <laughs> at the dinner table with your with a conservative person, but you could. Yes. Um, do you have thoughts about that that I'm not uh, sharing? And then just to answer Tiffany, your question about where you can get the list, the American Library Association website um, posts posts the lists, and uh, there are a boatloads of really interesting material there. And that is where most of my research came from this time around. If you go to our coalition page you will find all kinds of resources. Arjun has put together an amazing list of places, including the American Library Association, where you can find more information about book banning. Well, Sharon, thank you so very much. We really do appreciate it and there's time maybe for one more question. Does anybody, is there one more question? Somebody would Sharon, hi, Sumitra here. Um, I don't know if this is a question or a comment or a mixture of both, but uh, you know, to um, the, the reference that you made in the end as you ended your presentation uh, and to follow up on the conversation that we are having in Dr. Hussein's presentation as well. Um, you know, one, one way I think that we can um, accept, you know, it's by accepting um, intolerance uh, is by disagreeing with it. You know, we can we can convey to the person who is being intolerant that you know we disagree with their views, um, and you know that could be possibly one way. Uh, but the question you know I have that I grapple with is you know where do we draw the line? Um, there can be disagreements verbally, but if somebody's action becomes like a physical or a psychological or an emotional abuse, like how do we address that? Is my question and something that I, uh, you know, think about. Me too. I, I think in that, I, in that conversation about the, the, the Confederate flag, for example, Rain and I were saying that we felt like that created harm to some students and that, that the harm of their speech uh, gave us a space to say, uh, no, this would not be acceptable. So our debate really then went back to, are the people might be harmed by the pride flag? Uh, maybe less directly, they're, they're made uncomfortable. They're, they, you know, if it violates their religious principle or something else. And so is that harm great enough uh, to, to stop the expression? So that's, I think, where we got into ground that we just couldn't get ourselves out of. Uh, and I, but I do think, yeah, I, you know, having the opportunity to provide uh, counter speech is really, really important. And I think, um, especially when we talk about trying to be, for example, for me, trying to be an aspiring anti-racist ally or uh, trying to be an ally for communities I'm not a member of, to, 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 to be in spaces where I can uh, amplify voices who are, are making those cases or stand myself and make the case if, if, if need be. Um, that's really, really important. So thank you very much for for articulating that. And thanks again for um, allowing me to participate. It's, it, it's such a pleasure and a joy. Thank you. Well, Sharon, we just really appreciate it, Dr. Barnes. Thank you so very much.